Hello, travelers. Welcome back to Show and Tell with Reach the World. For over 20 years, Reach the World has used virtual exchange to inspire youth to become curious, confident global citizens. My name is Tim, and as part of Reach the World's efforts to support educators and families during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are sharing free live stream show and tell events with members of our global community. You can find an updated calendar of live stream events and much more at athome.reachtheworld.org. For today's show and tell, we're going on a journey to Spain. I'm excited to welcome Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistant, Cristina Sanchez. Cristina recently traveled from her home in Madrid, Spain to teach Spanish at the University of Arkansas in Monticello, Arkansas. Today, she's joining us from her home in Madrid to talk about that experience and share some Spanish culture with us. To all of our live stream viewers, please share any questions you may have for Christina using the YouTube chat bar. I've got a number of student questions that I can't wait to pass along to Christina. And we're gonna have a fantastic conversation today for about the next 30 minutes. So all of that said, let's get right to Christina. Welcome, Christina. Hi, thank you. Okay, so um, as Nick said, I'm Cristina Sanchez and I'm from Madrid, Spain. And I'm gonna talk about my eight month experience in Arkansas, which was kind of challenging sometimes, <laughs> but it was great. It was a great thing um, to do. Let me share this with all of you. Okay. So let's start with, um, a little presentation of my experience. So as I said, I'm from Spain, which is a little country in Europe, here it is. And it's this little country in the South, um, there is color pink. <laughs> it's the one uh, close to Afri Africa. And as you can see, it's a very small country if I compare it to the United States. So I went all the way from Madrid, this the community there is some red to Arkansas, okay? And I lived in Monticello, which is in the southeast of Arkansas. But before that, uh, Fulbright organized um, like an orientation, a summer orientation for all the Fulbright TAs. And we had the chance to meet one another and um, to have some workshops um, in which they explain some of the American uh, education sy system to us. Um, and as you can see in the photo, uh, there were people from all over the world, basically. Um, we have, uh, there were people from Brazil, from France, from Russia, from Egypt, Argentina, Venezuela, like a lot, of, a lot of places. I don't know if you can recognize some of the flags, but it was great. It was an unforgettable experience and we all get along really well. And um, the workshops were super interesting and gave us some information about how to grade in the United States because we have no idea how to actually deal with the students in the United States. So it was great. Um, so after the four day orientation, uh, my colleague from Argentina and I started our adventure in Arkansas, which was kind of challenging, <laughs> um, at least. Um, we got to the campus, this building here is part of the campus uh, that we lived in and we taught. And it was so different from the campuses that we have here in Spain. Here, the university campus are all full of schools, like the school, of education, school of, um, for example, the one I studied was the arts and humanities, and it was all related to schools. But here in this campus, there were a lot of things, like um, there was a gym, there was even a pond, the dorms, the apartments, a lot of schools. So that was really weird for me, because in, in Spain, you cannot find that all together. Departments are all over the city. And then if you go to a campus, you just go to a study and to the library. So it's so, it was so weird for me to see everything together and so close to each other. And um, to make it a little bit like home, 
we um, prepared that board with a little bit of our culture. And I don't know if you can recognize some of the words here. And we have different ways um, to say the same thing in different uh, Spanish variations. For example, we have a strawberry, which is fresa in Spain, but it's frutilla in Argentina. And we have some other um, words like bus, for me is autobus, but for Argentina it was colectivo. So it was kind of challenging that, that too, because even though we spoke the same language, both my colleague from Argentina and me, sometimes it was like, what have you said? What is that? I don't know what you have said, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that or can you rephrase it? So, and a lot of people were shocked when they saw the board, like, why do you have two names for the same thing? It's like, yeah, well, different varieties, I guess. <laughs> That's why we wanted to show um, that to our students. Um, okay. So, um, there were a lot of differences between uh, the United States and um, Spain, and in particular, uh, between Arkansas and Madrid, for example. The first one was public transportation. There was no public transportation where I lived, none. <laughs> so it was so weird because here in Madrid, we use public transportation a lot. We have buses that go everywhere and we have the subway, we have trains and we barely use vehicles, like our own cars, basically. And in the United States, I think pretty much everyone owns their own cars in vehicles. So, um, and here there was no tra public transportation and I felt like, oh my God, how am I gonna go everywhere? And so I have to ask for favors to everyone. Like, hey, can you give me a ride? Can you give me a ride? Um, because everyone owns a car there, which is great, but kind of weird for me. Also, um, in the United States, the, um, uh, the age to get your driving license is at 16. And everyone does it. Everyone tries to get it as soon as they turn to 16, even before. When they are 15, they just start to drive with a parent. Here, no, here is impossible. You have to be at least 18. It's super expensive and it's kind of difficult to get it. You have to study. You have to go to classes, like to, um, to study the um, um, like driving laws somehow. And then you have to go to classes to learn how to drive. Like my parents couldn't teach me. So it was really weird when people from the United States told me about it, like, what? Here is super difficult to actually get it. Okay, also food. Like here, this is a very typical dish from Spain, which is paella. It's super, super famous and it's great. It's rice with seafood. It has also like chicken and green peas and is part of our Mediterranean diet. And here we have an American hamburger, which is really good, <laughs> but it was kind of heavy for me sometimes. Like, like we in the cafeteria at uh, the university, we always have hamburgers, hot dogs and pizzas. And it was great, but at the same time it was like, oh my gosh, I really, really miss olive oil in Mediterranean diet really miss that even though I was happy with the food but it's still I mean I, I felt homesick sometimes also sizes um I don't know if you've traveled to other places to other countries but sizes in the United States are super big like extremely big <laughs> uh, compared to other countries um here as you can see like these are the American sizes and here are the European sizes the lines indicate the American sizes. So for me, it was like shocking to actually ask for a medium and they gave me like an extra large. What well, it would be an extra large here in, in Madrid. Like, wow, I cannot have 
this or I'm not able to eat all of these or to drink all of these. So I started to ask for the mini version or the smallest possible. <laughs> um, so it, it was great. Like uh, for the same amount of money, you got more things. But at the same time, I was like, I cannot eat that much or I cannot drink that much. And probably the most challenging thing was schedules or timetables. This was super difficult for me. Um, uh, when I got there, at first I, I really try, but pff, it, no, no, I couldn't. Like for example, breakfast time is the same, is the same in the United States and in Spain. Like breakfast goes from 6.30 until 8, 9, depending on your job or if you have to go to school. Then lunch time, it's so, so different. Like you guys in the United States have lunch around 11, 12 and that time. Here in Spain, we have lunch at 2, at 2 p.m., 2, 2.30, even 3 p.m which was so shocking for my friends in the United States. Like, how can you not be hungry? And it's like, well, I take a snack around 11, so I'm not hungry. <laughs> and, and they were shocked by uh, my timetable. Also dinner, like you have dinner around 5, 5.30, 6, maybe 7 sometimes. Well, we have dinner at 9 p.m. And if you see someone having dinner before eight, probably it's because they started having, like eating something at eight, but you're not gonna stop until eight, eight, 11, more or less. So, and I remember my friends coming over and telling me like, oh, are you having dinner now? At nine, nine thirty, And we were like, yes, it's, be it's because we are hungry now. And they were shocked, like, how can you be hungry now? What are you doing at six or seven? I was like, well, we're having a snack. We're fine. <laughs> and so for me, it was shocking to see people having like super big dinners at 5.30 or six. Like, I am not hungry. I cannot digest this at this time. So it was really weird, but... um. There was a point in which my friends got used to seeing us eating so late and it was and it was normal for me to see people eating but i never got used to doing that myself um also well um uh, we made a lot of friends and we celebrated some of your super big holidays or parties somehow one of them was halloween i was excited to celebrate Halloween because here is not a big deal. We are kind of starting to celebrate it, but we don't go trick or treating because we live in buildings. We don't live in houses here in Madrid. So it's kind of weird to go around the building asking for candies. So like we dressed up, but that's all we do. Basically we can go around the city, but we don't do anything else. So for me, I was excited to go trick or treating with uh, some of my friends, even though we're kind of old to do that, but it was great. <laughs> um, we also celebrated Thanksgiving and it was awesome because we don't have Thanksgiving in Spain. And um, like for us, like the big, biggest uh, celebration is Christmas. And the fact that you guys celebrate Thanksgiving as probably as big as Christmas was great for me because I, I wasn't going to stay for Christmas and being able to see everything that everyone does for Thanksgiving was amazing. So we don't celebrate once, we actually celebrate like three times. Uh, <laughs> we celebrate with the French language club, which is this photo that we have here. We prepare food, um, we prepare dishes from a lot of places like I prefer some food from Spain um for example I prefer croquetas I don't know if you know what is that um it's like a little bowl bowl with um, bechamel which is like a white sauce and chicken inside and then everything is um 
and has uh, breadcrumbs and it's fried and it's really good. I prepared that and I prepared some um, tomato toast, which are called pan tumaca. And the name comes from Catalan, not from Spanish, by the way. It's pan tumaca, which is bread with tomato, basically. So I prepared that uh, from the Spanish uh, side. And as you, in the photo, there are people from actually many places like France, the United States, Mexico, Argentina, Singapore, and I think Italy too, and Nicaragua. So it was great. It was our first Thanksgiving and it was awesome. Then we have another Thanksgiving that was the Friendsgiving thing. <laughs> I didn't know it was like a thing that friends do in the United States. So I was really excited <laughs> about celebrating it. And here again, we gathered all together and we ate a lot, basically. So, and we ate a lot of typical food from uh, America, but also like the typical food you eat in Thanksgiving, which is kind of heavy for me, <laughs> but it was totally worth it. And then we went to Memphis to actually celebrate the Thanksgiving, the real Thanksgiving, because we, we didn't have any family and we wanted to be with some friends that were from France and they didn't have a, any family relatives there too. So we were all together um, for thanks, the real Thanksgiving thing. And something that I really, really like is that um, like American people celebrate every single holiday um, like without any expense. Like everything is a big deal. I remember going to Walmart and see like decorations for um, Halloween, decorations for Thanksgiving, Christmas. Um, what was well, like every, every single holiday that you have, like you cannot find that here. Well, Christmas, yes, but Halloween, since it's not a big thing here, you barely can find anything, maybe costumes and stuff like that, but not all the candy, all the decorations for your house, all the, um, all the stuff to put on your doors. No, not at all. So it was, it was great to see that. And I remember filming some videos for my friends here in Spain and they were all like super surprised. Like, wow, American people do everything like super big. <laughs> so it was great. Um, also, uh, I participated in some programs, some volunteering programs when I was in the United States. And um, it was great because here in Madrid is a big city and it's not easy actually to find volunteering programs that are close to you. Um, so when I went there, since Monticello is a very small town somehow, it was very easy for me to find places in which I could help. Um, so it's something I really, really liked it. I really liked. I also, I was also part of um, Honor Society which was something I didn't even know that exists because in Spain, we don't have that. I was actually searching for honor societies on the internet, like, let's see if we have some. And we only have one or two and they are from the United States. So <laughs> we don't have any. So I was part of one in the at university and it was great. It was, it was a great, opportunity to see how it works there. We also went to some schools to introduce our culture. And it's also something that's, well, schools and nurseries. And we don't really have the chance here in, in Madrid to do that because Madrid is a big city. Like at least you work in that particular school, like you actually cannot go from one school to another to talk just to talk, at least you're an important person or you actually have something super, super interesting or super, I don't know, yeah, super interesting to say basically. <laughs> so um, it was great actually that I did all of that and I felt so happy. And I also organized food workshops, like cooking workshops for my students. I taught them how to prepare some Spanish dishes. Uh, like, for example, here, I don't know if you can see it, but these are Spanish tortillas, which are not like the typical tortillas from tacos and stuff, 
you know, there are tortillas, uh, which is like one of the most famous dishes here. And you're made with um, potatoes, eggs, onions, and olive oil. Olive oil is really important for us. <laughs> and uh, actually it was great because my students were able to prepare them perfectly. And a lot of people from Spain are not able to do them per like perfectly. <laughs> so when I, I remember I told my mom like, hey, I'm so proud of my students. They made it, they made the tortillas super well. And my mom was like, well, you're half Spanish now. <laughs> because most of the Spanish people cannot do them. <laughs> so it was actually great to experience like the differences and everything that Monticello could actually um, give me. Um, so that was it for the comparison somehow. Yeah, Christian, let me interrupt you just for a second. That was such an awesome overview of your time in the United States. And you got into some of the, the similarities and differences between life in Madrid and Spain and life in Arkansas in the United States. And a lot of, uh, a lot of our students uh, have questions for you okay. about um, very like specifically about some of the everyday life aspects of Spanish um, living in Spain. Sure. So I know you have a couple other things you want to show us about about that. I'd love to see it. Oh, okay. Um, no, it was what I want to show you is basically a little uh, bit more about my culture, about the Spanish culture, like things that are actually are kind of famous. Um, and then I can tell you about <laughs> my everyday life, basically, if you want to. Great, we're gonna get into your everyday life through our questions probably. If you wanna take like five minutes or so to go over some of the, the famous parts of Spanish culture, then we can share some questions with you. Okay. Okay, so here we have some. Uh, I, I don't know, can you see like the yeah. whole site? Oh, okay. That's great. So for example, the most popular dance is flamenco. I know if you have ever heard of uh, this kind of dance is the one that you dance with your hands like this. And um, I know if you can, you actually can try to do this at home. Um, is the most basic step. <laughs> but um, if you try to grab an apple and then eat it and then like throw it away, this is like a movement of flamenco. You grab an apple, you eat it, and you throw it. So it's something that you can actually try at home. And then once you get it with one hand, you can try with the other one, which is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> um, also, La Macarena, which uh, something that sh was kind of shocking for me is that not everyone in the United States knew that La Macarena comes from Spain. And it comes from the south of Spain and is like one of our most famous songs, probably. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who don't know La Macarena was this dance that was like this and everyone danced it in the 90s I think it was um <laughs> well as I told you before um some of our most famous dishes are paella which is this one the one with rice and tortilla de patata which is the one I taught my students how to cook we are famous for football or soccer which is here is our national team. And it's actually really good. <laughs> and we are so proud of this, um, of this sport here. It's a big thing. Um, like families gather together every Saturday or Sunday and watch the, the game while having snacks, being one another. We actually, like, if you're like my dad, he celebrates like, uh, when his football, his soccer team wins, he celebrated as, oh my gosh, as if he will, has won the lottery, basically. So it's great. Also basketball and tennis are really famous sports too. And we have actually very good um, players in both. And some of the um, Spanish uh, basketball players are now in the N NBA, is that? So we are really proud of them. Okay, and some of our traditions are these ones. We, um, well, not now because of the COVID-19, but uh, we usually uh, give two kisses on the cheek, like cheek kissing is a big thing here when we greet someone. 
so we give dos besos, un beso y otro beso. Las mejillas. We also have uh, sobremesa or table talk, which is once you finish eating, no matter if it's lunch or dinner, you stay on the table for at least 30, 40 more minutes, just talking. And it's something that my friends in the United States were like, how can you do that? You don't have things to do? I was like, yeah, but it's part of our digesting <laughs> uh, process somehow. <laughs> also, as I told you before, our Spanish timetable, which is very different from um, everywhere else, actually. <laughs> We also celebrate Easter, Christmas, and patron saints. And there are a lot of people that think that Spanish people have a lot of holidays. And that's kind of true. I realized it was kind of true when I went to the United States because we, um, every single time there is the same patron of Madrid, the same patron of the, um, the whole province or the same patron of whatever, we actually have a holiday there and we don't have to go to work or we don't have a school. So we have a lot of um, holidays and a lot of days off, if I compare it to the uh, United States. Also, Santa Claus might bring us presents, but we celebrate the three, the three, uh, the three kings or the three wise men. Those are the ones that actually bring us presents in Christmas. And since there are three of them, they bring us a lot of presents. <laughs> That's what we usually do and say. And we also welcome every single year uh, by eating 12 grapes. Um, this is something that um, some people in Mexico do too. And basically we eat 12 grapes, uh, one grape per month. And while we are eating them, we have to ask for wishes. So 12 wishes. Too. And while we are um, doing it, we have like the bell tolls. So you have to eat one grape per bell toll somehow. So it's kind of difficult. It's not that easy to do it. <laughs> and the last thing that um, we Spanish people do is ir uh, de tapas or uh, tapeo, which is probably our most famous activity. It consists of going to a bar, ask for a drink, and the, the waiter or the waitress brings us some small plate with a typical Spanish dish like this one. And we just eat it and drink it and drink. And we stay there and every time we ask for a new drink, they bring us another plate so we can expands like hours doing this basically. And it's probably our most famous activity and we actually love doing it. <laughs> and that was it. So I hope you know a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, thank you. thank you so much, Christina. That was fantastic. What a great uh, overview. If you want to come out of screen share, I would love to share some of the student questions that we have for you. Um, I think that will get us to uh, a couple other things. Um, there's, there's a long list of them, so I'll just get started. Um, Jose Adriel would like to know what you like to do for fun in Spain. Well, we go uh, to eat some tapas. We go to some bars and we um, eat some tapas. We like to go to the cinema. We like to go to museums and theaters. There are a lot of things to do basically. But since this is a big city, we don't really have like um, countryside nearby. So everything that we do is city related. <laughs> so basically. Right. Yeah. yeah, great. That, that runs right into our next question from Tahina who wants to know what your favorite thing, what's your favorite thing about Madrid? What is your favorite thing about your home city? Um, that I live close to everything. <laughs> I live in the city center of the of Madrid and I can go walking. I can go um on foot everywhere, basically. So yeah. it's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um you obviously obviously speak amazing English. Um one of our students, um Jose, wanted to know 
how long do you have to go to school or study English, a second language for you like English, in order to be able to teach in the way that you did at the University of Arkansas? Well, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I did a degree in English studies, which is like a bachelor degree. I don't know how you call it in the United States. It's like English or a major in English or something like that. I'm not sure. So that's what I did. And then I got a master's degree. Well, I have two master's degree, one in teaching and one in teaching Spanish as a foreign language. So thanks to both masters plus the degree, I got the chance to go. But I had to have, I don't know if you're familiar to the levels, but I had to have a C1 to go to the United States. Okay, so uh, is that a, that's a pretty high level of, of proficiency? Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, it's like a bilingual, bilingual level somehow. Yeah, awesome. Well, I, I'm curious just for my own um, wondering, you were teaching with another uh, Fulbright foreign language teaching assistant who is from Argentina and you pointed out those examples of different words in with mm -hmm. the same language, but with different dialects for the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Was that confusing to your students? Um, we didn't teach the same students, mm -hmm. so it was okay. But yeah. we always try to use the books, basically. Like, we use the versions that the books have. Sometimes it was a version from Argentina. Sometimes it was a version from Colombia. Sometimes it was a version from Mexico. Or sometimes it was a version from Spain. So for me, I remember telling, like, my students actually corrected me sometimes. Like, you said coche and it's carro. carro. I was like, yeah, it's the same, but it's so weird for me to say carro. Uh, do you it that way? So sometimes I had to apologize with them, but it was like, okay, in the exam and while you're talking, you can use carro perfectly, but I'm going to use cote. <laughs> so uh, first, like, since we didn't teach the same students, it was okay. It's one of the fun parts about learning languages that there are often multiple ways of saying the same thing, uh, depending on where you're learning it. Um, very cool. Um, do you have, um, Frenesy would like to know if you have ever been to a bullfight. I've never been to a bullfight. I, okay, maybe I'm not the best Spanish person at this, but I don't like them. I don't really like, like it was, a very famous thing when I was little and my parents used to go, my grandma used to love it, but I don't really like it. So it's something that actually we, uh, we were able to see even on TV and it's a big thing here, but no. <laughs> Not for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, Dana knows that there's a king and queen in Spain. Um, what is their, what's the deal with the king and queen of Spain? Okay, so we have king and queen, but they are like the, um, they have a representative role of the country, but we also have a president. So basically, uh, like, when like the king and the queen don't i don't want to say they don't do anything <laughs> but they are the representative roles of spain but they don't rule the country that's a way okay, okay. um uh Tahina would like to know if you have any sisters or brothers i do i have a little brother who is around the house right now and i have a stepbrother who is in mexico all right, right now Fantastic. Um, Diego would like to know how Spain is keeping people safe from the coronavirus. Ooh, well, uh, when I got here, everything was super strict. Like everyone had to be uh, at home. They couldn't leave their homes. At least they went to pharmacies or supermarkets. That was it. Like if uh, you had to go to work, you have to show uh, a police officers like um, like a letter or something that was like a permission, but everything was super strict. Thank God, I uh, it was like since I got here, I had to be like in a strict quarantine for ten days. But Spanish people were in quarantine for two months and a half, so wow. it was really really hard for them. Yeah, are you still? Um, 
spending most of your time at home? Yes, here in Madrid is different. Like the whole country um, is going through different phases. Like for example, um, in most of the areas of Spain, they are like in phase two. Somehow they are going to start phase three. So these phases are giving them more uh, freedom. But here in Madrid, we are in phase one because we are one of the biggest cities. And um, like we, we actually can go out and do some exercise, but we have like hours to do that. Okay. So my hours to go out is from 8 p.m. until 11 p.m. Hmm. We can go to uh, restaurants, but only they have like an outer port, like a terrace or something. And we can also go out in the morning from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. For the, to do the same. And we can, we actually can go shopping. We can go to stores, <laughs> okay. but that's it. Like for example, malls, sorry, malls are not open yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. That's those student questions are fantastic. I want to thank those students for submitting them. Um, I would love to bring in one of our, our great friends of Reach the World, uh, Spanish teacher in Nebraska, Kelly Garcia. Um, I know you two were talking before the call about she, she's raising her hand that she has a question. I want to give her a chance to ask her question. And then maybe we can do a little bit of uh, teaching of some Spanish language phrases. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, let's uh, unmute you and you're good to go. Well, my question is, you were talking about the paella versus the hamburger and the serving sizes on the drinks. Was there a weight gain involved when you got here and started eating American food? Did you notice a difference in how you felt? A little bit, I felt heavy, actually. Like I, <laughs> it's not like actually, I, I think I didn't gain weight. Like my parents were worried about that. Like you're gonna gain maybe not a lot of weight, but you're gonna get uh, gain some weight. But actually, I, I didn't. But the things like I felt heavy, like yes. myself, uh, because the diet was heavier than the one I'm used to. Yes. So, um, but that's it. <laughs> that has happened to some of our um, teachers who come from China and teach with us, we've, mm -hmm. we've noticed that they start becoming more Americanized and then they start just becoming more American like that and gaining a little bit of weight. So mm. their, their families in their home countries are like, what are you doing? And it's like, oh, the food, it's the food and the culture. So, mm -hmm. okay. So what is the cool thing for the um, kids to say in Madrid now? Um, for example, oh, like the way uh, we say, oh, that's so cool. It's como, que guay. Que guay. Que guay. Like, G-U-A-Y, uh, actually. <laughs> that's exactly how I spelled it. <laughs> perfect, perfect, yes. Um, um, which would be, in Mexico, I think it's que padre, right? Que Something padre, like that. yeah. Uh -huh. Genial. Um, uh huh. We also use genial, but the most Spanish way, like from Spain, to say it is que guay. <laughs> I'll have to pass that along to my students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Christina, I really like I like how um, hearing you present in English. I pick up a few words that I think you learned in English while you were in Arkansas too. I, I hear I hear uh, a, a few sort of conversational slang uh, American things in what you say too. I feel like it's been a a good language exchange. You have given some some great uh, like dialect and and um, you know great phrases to Americans, and maybe they've taught you some things in in English as well. Oh, <laughs> um, and I not um, uh, like the things that like. The things I learned are actually like bad words. Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> saying bad words. And so I cannot, like there were some expressions, but I don't remember any particular one. Like if they tell me, I, I will be like, oh yes, I remember the meaning of that. But right now I cannot really think of any 
anyone right now. There is not a bad word. Sure. Well, we can, we can skip that one. That's okay. Your point is well taken. Uh, uh, Kelly, I wanted to ask you, you work with, with students in Nebraska, you know, all year long doing great work teaching Spanish. Um, what are some of the things that they, um, they have questions about or are especially interested in as it relates to Spanish language and culture? Shopping. They're interested in shopping. <laughs> They are. They want to know how much things cost and, and where do you go shopping and what's the cool thing to do and, you know, fashion questions. I get those too from my students. Okay, something that um, really like made, made me angry when I was in the United States is like you don't include the taxes in the price, mm -hmm. in the tax. It's something that we do here. So we know like if we're for example, if we are seeing a shirt and we see the tag and we see, okay, so this cost $20. It's gonna be $20 at the end. So you're not gonna find it any surprises. But at the beginning, it was shocking. Like, hey, why, am I, why are you charging me more? So here, well, first of all, we don't have dollars. We have euros, which is like the common currency in the European Union, not in the whole continent, but in the European Union. And like made for brands like Nike or Adidas or things like that, like products are cheaper in the United States. Yeah, like jeans uh, from, I think Levi, is it called? Mm -hmm. They are so much more, so much cheaper in the United States and here are super expensive. Mm -hmm. but we have other brands that are kind of famous in the United States like Sara or like things like that, that mango and those brands are cheaper here because they come from here somehow but um, like in normal things the prices are very similar maybe uh, since euros are a little bit more expensive than dollars mm -hmm. people can think that they are more expensive but on average it is basically the same well i okay that brings me to another shopping question in some of the textbooks that i know colleagues have used is there el corte inglés yes we do have that it's usually it's it, they, that appears in the textbooks a lot of times i personally do not use a textbook and i haven't for years but that's stuck in my mind because i was wondering about that Mm -hmm. It's a department store and it's um, since it has that name at the beginning I thought it was English because it has the Corte Inglés <laughs> but actually it's not it's from Spain and you can find it er in every big city not every city in Spain has it but every big city here has at least one or two in Madrid we have a lot of them to be honest and uh, they even organized this little show in Christmas, which is really famous. So they are very popular too for that. Okay, okay. so it is a sort of a, a Spanish Macy's or a Spanish um, something along those lines? Yeah, it's like a Spanish Macy's basically because you can find every, everything there uh, from clothes, jewelry, um, food, even food. <laughs> so. Okay. And they have, um, depending on uh, which courting list you go to, you can find restaurants. There's one that has a great um, terrace on top of the building. So, and it's kind of expensive. Hey. Huh? <laughs> well, that was a, that's a great question. I hope Kelly, that that gives your students some good answers. You can answer all their shopping related questions uh, <laughs> in the next school year. Um, I, we have to wrap things up. We've gone a little over time, but this has been such a fantastic conversation. I didn't mind doing that at all. It was so much fun. Um, Christina, before we go, I wanna ask you a last question that we asked all of our participants. And that is when COVID-19 is over and people are traveling uh, and moving around again, what will be your next adventure? Mm, I don't know, I'm eager to travel again. Like at first I was like, oh, I want to be home. I want to be safe. But right now, I really want to travel. My intention is to go back to the United States. Uh, not this year, but probably next school year uh, to try to do a PhD 
So hopefully, <laughs> I maybe can... you should come to Nebraska then. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. I I'm, I'm gonna search for a lot of universities in a lot of places. So yeah. I definitely think of Nebraska. But, Fantastic. Yeah. That actually, I, I can't resist. I have one more question. For any student who is lucky enough to come and visit your home city of Madrid, what is one thing that they have to do when they're there? Uh, they have to go to this rooftop, uh, sorry, rooftop, uh, which is like a bar and restaurant. And you have an excellent view. And at the same time, you're enjoying this tapas thing. Mm -hmm. So it's great because you can, um, it is called, um, uh, um, Círculo de Bellas Artes. It's like a circle of arts mm -hmm. somehow. <laughs> and you go there and you have like probably one of the most beautiful views. All right. Fine arts. Fine arts. <laughs> Fine arts. Fine okay. Arts. Well, you know, for everyone, for everyone in the United States, all of our students who are joining us on this live stream and, and watching the recording, go on Google Maps and look it up <laughs> and you can travel there virtually for now and then plan your trip there for when you can, uh, somewhere down the road when you get to go visit uh, your new friend, Christina in Madrid and, uh, and explore some more Spanish culture. So with that, I just wanna say thank you, Christina. Thank you so much for joining us, Kelly. Um, this has been a lot of fun learning about your experiences in the United States and Spanish culture. I wanna thank our entire live stream audience today and everyone who's gonna watch this recording after the fact on YouTube. Uh, we had a really great crowd, great student questions. Uh, we are have a couple more live stream events left to go this week. And then next week is Oceans Week, which is a big deal. And we have a really exciting lineup of, of events that I hope you'll check out at athome.reachtheworld.org. So with that, I'm gonna say goodbye. Goodbye, thank you. Adios. Thanks, Christina.